Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Well, hi there, I would have and welcome once again to our Bible study here at Bible Talk. We're so blessed that you can join us and be with us as we gather here at our table to feast on the Word of God once again. And as Alice said, if you were here before we started, Hi. we're continuing on in our study of Paul's letter, first letter to the church at Thessalonica, the Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians, and we're in chapter 5. But before we get into the Bible study, I'm going to ask Brother Mark to, to lead us in a, ask the Lord's blessing upon our time together. Oh, oh Lord, I ask you to come down and be with us, to guide us in what we say and do in this Bible study, and just let your Holy Spirit come forth and affect lives and teach us and equip us. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. All right, well, this is uh, our last study here in the year 2011. It's been a blessed year. Amen. Um, but before we start the study, why don't we sing that old, old hymn? Mm -hmm. All right. Which one is that? Sometimes you feel like a nut, sometimes you don't. Okay. Why should we do that? <laughs> because it's, it's very important. In. It's a lead into something. I think that was uh, the, the candy company. They made Mounds, Mounds and Almond, Almond Joy, Joy, and they right. said sometimes you feel like a nut and sometimes you don't. Uh, sometimes you may feel like having fish, and sometimes you may feel like having a good old steak. Sometimes you wake up in the morning and you feel like popping out of bed, and other times you feel like laying there for a long time before you get out of bed. Sometimes it rains, sometimes it's sun. Sometimes it's warm, sometimes it's cold. A lot of things change. Yes. But believers, disciples of Jesus Christ, are supposed to have an always kind of life. And as Alice had, had said in our introduction, that uh, you know we we left off last week talking about in in First Thessalonians five uh, sixteen seventeen and eighteen, saying, "Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus." And I was thinking as I was praying this week that we're supposed to be an always kind of people. Now, let me just take you through this and think about this. David wrote in the Psalms and said, Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them out of, the, out of them all. That's Psalm 34, 19. Life is a bumpy road. Yes. That's a fact. <clears throat> Even for the righteous. You know, it says God sends the rain on the just and the unjust. Regardless of how well or poorly you live this life, it's a bumpy road. All right? And yet, God spoke through the prophet Isaiah, Isaiah 26, 7, and said this, The way of the righteous is smooth. And then said, O upright one, make the path of the righteous level. Well, if life is a bumpy road, but God makes the way smooth. If we allow him to go before us. Well, the question is, you know, does he go through like a D9 caterpillar bulldozer, and, and knock everything out of the way? Well, the answer to that should be obvious to you. If the afflictions of the righteous are many, and they still have that bumpy road, that's not the answer. Mm -hmm. So years ago we were doing a study in Isaiah, and it, it just dawned on me at the time that there was a commercial on at that time. Mm -hmm. I don't, it was a luxury car. I really don't remember which one it was. Great coupon? Uh, no, but thank you anyhow. Oh, okay. A diamond cutter. Not the one I'm thinking of, but thank you anyhow. Uh, write to us at office at BibleTalk.com with your guess. Okay. It, it was, I believe, somebody pouring, sitting in a, a luxury car. Okay. And they had, uh, well, maybe there was one with a diamond cutter. I yeah. remember that. And I remember the, the great coupon, but that, that wasn't was about the smooth ride. And in any event, they had a, they had a cut shot mm -hmm. of the inside of the car where somebody is pouring a glass of champagne I in the car or something. Yes, yes. And then they had a, an exterior shot the of the outside, and the car is going down this bumpy road. 
So the outside shot shows the tires, the wheels of the car going up and down, up and down, and up and down, and yet inside, level. it's level and smooth. Now, the point was, this was an advertisement about their suspension and shock absorbers in the car that provided the smooth ride, even though the road stays bumpy. And that was really a good analogy because that's what the Lord does. He doesn't He doesn't take and knock down and make flat at this time all of those bumps. But what He does is the Lord is our buffer. The shock absorbers intercede, intervene, and stand between us and that bumpy road. He takes those bumps upon Himself and our lives are supposed to be smooth and consistent. All right? The road that leads to life, Jesus said, the road that the Lord leads us on is narrow and leads to a narrow gate, right? Mm -hmm. While the way that the world leads, would have, would lead us, is wide and easy, but it leads to destruction. Mm -hmm. So the Lord, the, the road that the Lord leads us on is a, can be a bumpy road. I mean, look at the life of Paul. If you don't think that's a bumpy road. And yet, he said he walked always in the triumph of Christ Jesus. <clears throat> so the Apostle Paul, even though, I mean, look at what his life went through. His life is smooth and consistent in the Spirit. Right? And that's what God wants us in our life. We ended last week, we were talking about some of the things, when we were talking about giving thanks for, for all things. The road that took Joseph to be the redeemer of his brothers. <clears throat> and remember, that is a, a foreshadowing, a living prophecy of Christ who is to come. Mm -hmm. You know, Joseph is given this vision of what will be, and he's shown the, the, the path of his life. Mm -hmm. And yet immediately, his brother, his own people, take him and throw him down a well, sell him off into slavery, goes into jail in Egypt. Right? Mm -hmm. But winds up being used of God to deliver his brothers. And he said to his brothers, you may have meant this for evil, but God meant it for good. All right? But that road that the Lord took Joseph on was indeed had its ups and downs. The path that led Paul and Silas to minister the word of life to a jailer in Philippi had some dark turns. Remember we talked about that? Yes, yes. But God led him there for a purpose. All right? The path that the Father and the Spirit led Jesus on from crib to cross and then from an empty tomb was surely not the easy way. Right? God said through Isaiah, He said, For I, the Lord, do not change. He said that's Malachi 3.6. Right? There is supposed to be a consistency in our lives. Sometimes you feel this way, sometimes you feel that way. Sometimes you hunger for this and sometimes you hunger for that. But there needs to be some always in your life. Unchanging. All right? Because we were made in the image of God, he says he's not he does not change. So, a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, shielded by his faith, as it says, Paul wrote to the Ephesians in the full armor of God, mm -hmm. should always, and if you have a pencil and paper, write these down and think about it. You may have some more you can think of. If you do, email me. We should always, without fail, always, when I, I don't want to hammer this, but when I say always, uh, if you were to look that up in Hebrew or look that up in Greek, you would actually find that the word means always, always. without exception, without fail. Mm -hmm. We should always rejoice. That's what Paul wrote here. I mean, it's simple. I want to remember a verse into remembering verses. Here's an easy one to remember. Verse 16, rejoice always. There's no time in your life that you should not rejoice. Pray. You should pray without ceasing. By the way, think about this. If you don't just look here in 1 Thessalonians, 
Philippians 4 4, Paul says the same thing. Rejoice in the Lord always. Pray. We're to pray without ceasing. Right? We're to pray in all things. Jesus said it. Paul said it. Peter said it. There is no time in your life that you should not be praying. Give thanks. That's what we were talking about last week. There is no time in your life, there is no circumstance in your life, there is no situation in your life that should cause you to cease giving thanks. This is the way, the path of a victorious life in the Spirit of God. And that's what Paul is doing as he closes his letter, his first letter, by the way, to the Thessalonians, right? He's giving them this core instruction for living that triumphant, victorious life in Jesus Christ. But here, listen to this, you should always forgive. Peter said to Jesus, how many times do I have to forgive? Seven times seventy? Or, or seven times? And Peter was like, you know, I gotta, somebody, somebody hurts me and I forgive them? And they come back and hurt me again, I gotta forgive them. I have to forgive them seven times? And Jesus said, no, seven times seventy. And that seven times seventy was the same as Jesus saying, one more time, always, always forgive. Bear in mind that if you don't forgive, Jesus Christ said, check it out in Matthew. If you do not forgive those who offend and hurt and harm you, God the Father will not forgive you. That's what he said. So you better always forgive. And here's the key, because this is the thing that Jesus said. Everything winds up in this one word, love. You should always love. Yes, you should love the people that love you. But he says you've got to love your enemies. There is no point, no circumstance, no activity, no person that you should not, as a Christian, should not love. So these five things, I really believe, are, we, you need to spend time meditating on this, thinking about it, talking to the Lord about it. You should always rejoice. You should always pray. You should always give thanks. You should always forgive. You should always love. There should never be an exception to that. If you want to live the abundant, joy-filled life that Christ came to provide for you. If you fail in these five things, any of these five things, then you will surely fail at the next thing that Paul talks about. In verse 19, he says, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 19, do not quench the Spirit. Well, if you fail to forgive, if you fail to pray, if you fail to give thanks, if you fail in any of these things, you will be quenching the Spirit of God. Could it be considered the opposite? You quench the Spirit and then you fail to do these things. I don't know, Mark. Because you're what, you, which came first? The chicken or the egg? Yes, I mean, it's that kind of deal, right? Now, for many years, and I, and I still believe this, when, he, when Paul talks about quenching the Spirit, um, he must have had in mind the flowing of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. He was teaching that in Corinth, where he is sitting as he writes this letter. Right? I mean, he taught so much about the gifts flowing in the gifts of the Holy Spirit, operating in the gifts of the Spirit. In, in Karn. I mean, read 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Well, that's where he was when he's writing this letter to the Thessalonians. Okay? So, and his teaching is consistent. Um, by, the, by the way, on Bible Talk somewhere, if you, I, I can't tell you where this is offhand, but if you want to know, just write to us again at office at BibleTalk.com. We have a teaching called Flowing in the Gifts of the Holy Spirit. You surely don't want to stifle the Holy Spirit. To stifle, to quench, means to, to suppress, extinguish. to extinguish, all right? The, the operation of the Holy Spirit. Zephaniah, I want, to, I want to read to you from Zephaniah chapter 1, verse 12, because this is a, a verse that has struck me and I've preached on a lot of different ways. But God spoke to the prophet Zephaniah and said this, It will come about at that time that I will search Jerusalem with lamps, and I will punish the men 
who are stagnant in spirit. You see, being stagnant in spirit, you know, stagnant water just doesn't move. Nothing happens, all right? And if you want to find out more about that being stagnant in the spirit, you know, re go find that thing flowing in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Or write to me and find out where it is. We have to not stop operating in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Paul knows that that is the only way that the body of Christ can function properly as God designed it. Go read 1 Corinthians 12 this week. Spend time in there. Pray about it. All right? Too much of the church today denies the operation of the gifts of the Holy Spirit in this day and in this present age. They're wrong. They're wrong. Because God is not a man that he should change. Jesus Christ, who is the Word, is the same yesterday, today, and yes, forever. God has placed the power of his Holy Spirit in his body to bless the body. Go read. I'm not going to go through the whole thing here. So, certainly Paul has that in mind when he writes, don't quench the Spirit. But there's something beyond that. And this is rarely considered. I've never seen this in any teachings, and because I, I'll say this as kind of a warning, right? I've, I have, as a matter of fact, I scanned a lot of commentaries just to see if somebody else was teaching this, and I, I don't see this taught elsewhere. Elsewhere. In other places. But I think that if we logically look at this and put the teaching of Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit, together, let me read you this. This is again from Paul's letter to the Thessalonians, but the next letter, 2 Thessalonians, and he writes this as kind of a, an adjunct to 1 Thessalonians to make sure that they're understanding what he's written here, right? right? And in that letter, because there's so much that he has written in both these letters about the coming of Jesus Christ and what must precede the coming of Jesus Christ, and we've covered that well in these earlier uh, parts of this particular study, which are available on, you know, on demand. You can go back and watch any of them. He wrote in 2 Thessalonians, and you know what restrains him, that being the man of lawlessness, the son of destruction, right? You know what restrains him now, so that in his time he will be revealed. He's talking about the Antichrist here, right? Yes. <clears throat> For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work, only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 6 and 7. So he's saying that we know that the, the devil is at work in this present world, but the Antichrist, the personification of this evil, the man of lawlessness and destruction, is not going to be revealed until that which restrains him is taken out of the way. And he uses that personal pronoun until he is taken out. What stops? What, what hinders the work of the devil? What restrains the devil today? The Holy Spirit. Right. And I think, I think we did talk about that a little bit, just how, how the Holy Spirit restrains evil. Yes. Now, obviously, not completely. Maybe it would be completely if... The body was functioning. Probably. Yes. Because the Holy Spirit operates through the body through the body, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. It says, in, in 1 Corinthians 12, it says, here's how the Spirit works. He works through each one individually as He wills. Mm -hmm. He operates through the body of Christ. Think about this verse. This is Paul writing to the Romans, Romans chapter 2. He said, you who boast in the law, though you're breaking the law, do you dishonor God? For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you, just as it is written. You got that? He's saying that the name of God is blasphemed because of the activity and or lack of activity, proper activity, of the church. Paul wrote to the Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 27, and he said, do not give the devil an opportunity. What I'm saying here is I want to try and make this as clear as I can. 
that when we quench the Holy Spirit, when we are not operating as the Spirit of God would lead us, and that goes back to the things that I just talked about, rejoicing always, giving thanks always, praying always, forgiving always, loving always. When we're not doing that, we are indeed giving the devil an opportunity. We are giving blaspheme. the world opportunity to blaspheme, cause to blaspheme. Now, if you can't see this, that as the church fails, the church, I'm, and you know what, I'm not going to apologize for what I'm about to say. When over and over and over, when the world sees high visibility pastors carted off in handcuffs because of their activity, or broken because of their immorality, they are giving, they are quenching the Holy Spirit. They're extinguishing the fire. They're, they're hiding the fire and giving the devil an opportunity and the world opportunity to blaspheme. Now, we're not going to prevent the devil from operating, but we restrain him. Yes, yes. Yeah. Okay? I am a believer in the fact that there will be, in the middle of the tribulation, a rapture where, because he who restrains the, the Antichrist until he's revealed will be removed. But God has made a promise. He said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. He's not going to pull the Holy Spirit out of the world and leave the body behind. After all, we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. So that, to me, kind of indicates that that will be the time that when the Holy Spirit departs, so do we. You have a minority view, by the way. It doesn't matter to me. I have a minority view about most everything. Right. But that's why it says, show yourself approved, study to show yourself approved unto God, not to show yourself approved to man. I'll say this in as much love as I can muster, and I can muster a lot of love. I don't care what you think. I, I don't care what you think. About you. you can reject what I say, but you better test what I say. And if it's the Word of God, you're responsible for it. Because what I think, what my opinion is, matters not a little teeny bit. What the Word of God says matters entirely. Because it is the Word of God that will judge you on the last day. That's what Jesus said. That's what he said. So you think about this, okay? When we do not walk in the Spirit as a body, we are to the de let me let me rephrase that to the degree that we stifle the Holy Spirit by living ungodly, we open the door to evil to operate. It is the body of Christ that has the power to put restraint on the activity of the devil by operating by us operating in the Spirit of God. We live in a world where, where, remember, our warfare is not against flesh and blood, but against powers, principalities, right? And the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, not, not earthly. When Christ encountered, you know, uh, let me back up half a second. The Apostle Paul wrote to his son in the faith, Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 3, and he said that in the last days, perilous times would come. Now, we're talking about the last days here, right? That word perilous in the Greek that is used in 2 Timothy chapter 3 is exactly the same word that is only used in one other place in the New Testament, and that is when Jesus Christ encounters the demon-possessed man as after he crossed over the Sea of Galilee. And what that, again, I, I think that if you look at that, what that's going to indicate is what Paul means by the perilous the perils of the last day, it is demonic rage. And when Satan encounters Jesus Christ, he goes into demonic rage. We, Paul says, bring the knowledge of the presence of Christ Jesus into every place. So when, no matter where you go, you're going to upset the devil if you're operating in the Spirit. Hallelujah. You're supposed to upset the devil. If the devil leaves you alone and you're not upsetting him, it's probably because you don't upset him.
set the devil. Make it, make it, you want to make a New Year's resolution for this year? I'm not into that very much. But if I was going to make a New Year's resolution, this would be a good one. I'm going to upset you, devil. Because I am going to bring into your presence, in every place I put my foot, the fragrant aroma of the knowledge of the presence of Christ Jesus. I don't walk this planet alone. I may travel a rocky road, but it's one that the Lord smooths out because he goes with me. He said he would never leave me nor forsake me. This is why David could say, way back when, 3,000 years ago, he said, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil, for thou art with me. The church is not upsetting the devil very much today, it doesn't seem to me. We're upsetting, this part of the church is upsetting that part of the church. We're upsetting each other. Yeah. But our, okay, so now I'm going to go on really dangerous ground. Our power to restrain the devil right. and, make, and see things change in the people around us. Mm -hmm. Because you want to know something? The world's not going to change other than getting worse and worse until Christ returns. But God is still in the business of saving people. Mm -hmm. Our power to make change in this world is by walking and living in the Spirit of God. Now, if you're not getting what I'm saying, let me be a little more blunt. Why don't you be more blunt? Why don't I be more blunt? You are not going to restrain the devil by your choice of who you vote for in this election in the United States of America in 2012. That's not what makes the world a better place. Because when all is said and done, I don't know who's going to get elected, quite frankly, I don't care because I know God is in charge of that. If, if most Americans, oh wow, oh, here we go. Here we go. Most Americans are too uneducated to understand we don't even live in a democracy. We live in a republic. You don't vote and put a president in place. You vote to suggest to the electoral college who they will elect as President of the United States. The President of the United States is not elected by common vote, by popular vote. The President of the United States is elected by the Electoral College. And they're wrong too, because when all is said and done, God will put in place who God wants in place. And you want to know something? The world will still be going downhill. And the Word of God will still be true where John wrote and said, this present world is in the power of the evil one. Until you hear the hoofbeats and see a white horse in the sky, and you see the Lord Jesus Christ with a robe, with the Word of God written on his thigh, flames shooting forth from him, when you see that, I'm going to tell you, the world is going to change for the better. But you have the power to make a difference every place you go by walking in the Spirit of God, by operating in the Spirit of God, by praying without ceasing, by rejoicing always, by giving thanks in all things, by forgiving those around you, by loving those around you, regardless of what the circumstances are and how they treat you. That is the power you have to restrain the devil. There, I've said it. So anyhow, don't quench the Holy Spirit. And then he says, in verse 20, do not despise prophetic utterances. Now, what are prophetic utterances? It's not somebody coming to your church and standing there and telling you what a wonderful person you are and how God wants you rich and how God's going to do this way and that. You know, listen, I know prophecy can take a lot of forms, but bear in mind that prophecy is God sending somebody to speak for Him. And they are only allowed to speak what God has told them to speak. So, I was just going to say in my footnote, it says, for, or, for prophetic gifts. Well, what's the difference? The prophetic gift is not operating unless there's a prophetic utterance. <laughs> All right? Because pro, pro, prophetic utterance or prophecy is speaking forth something that God has given you, to, somebody to say. And prophecy is very important. I mean, again, go back to 1 Corinthians where Paul says, you know, we, we should seek these gifts. We should desire earnestly the gifts of the Holy Spirit, but especially prophecy. So I, I seeing it as a gift is 
It should, you should know that it's not anything that's coming from you, it's something that's been given to you. It has to be, have been given to you to right. speak, all right? But let, let's just talk about this for a second, because I, I think we don't really understand what prophecy is today very much, okay? Let's start with a basic. And here's the, your understanding of prophecy, here's the basic truth. Revelation 19.10, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Prophecy is not, you know, future. Well, it, it can be future, but it can be it can be about the present. It can be about the past. It is God speaking through a human being to you, and ultimately, it is the testimony of Jesus Christ. All right. Now, what should prophecy be if it's God speaking through you? Well, Paul wrote to Tis Timothy again, Second Timothy chapter three, mm -hmm. and he said, "All Scripture is inspired by God." and profitable for... Now, prophecy ranks with Scripture because it is the Word of God. If it's truly prophecy, right? It's profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. Now, is it? can it be encouraging? It should be encouraging to you. Anytime God is speaking to you, regardless of what he has to say, it should be encouraging to you because his purpose in your life is life. And life abundant. That's his purpose, right? So he's only going to speak to you. If you need correction, praise God. We're back to give thanks for all things. Rejoice always. When God speaks to you and tells you, hey, you're doing wrong, you better sit there and give thanks. God spoke to the prophet Jeremiah. This is Jeremiah 23, 21 and 22. Because there were so many false prophets back then, and yes, there are today, I did not send these prophets, but they ran. I did not speak to them, but they prophesied. But if they had stood in my counsel, then they would have announced my words to my people and would have turned them back from their evil way and from the evil of their deeds. God sent out the prophets to turn his own people back from their evil ways and evil deeds. When somebody shows up and it's like, you know, it's like the Christian psychic hotline uh, telling you where you're going to find true love and, and wealth and, you know, rub this on your wallet and get rich. Well, all I can tell you is what the New Testament writer John says when he says, test the spirits, for many false prophets have gone abroad. All right? Test the spirits. Which leads us to verse 21. Which is very similar. But examine everything carefully. Hold fast to that which is good. Well, there's a trend in the world today to say, okay, it's an evil, don't discriminate. Oh, right. Okay? Well, it, you know, that sounds nice, but it's too general. Okay? There is, you better discriminate. Mm -hmm. If you have a discriminating palate, you can tell something that tastes good from something that tastes bad. Mm -hmm. That might get you sick. Well, that, that's discriminating. That's putting something to the test. Yes. There's bad discrimination, or, but there's also good discrimination, all right? You want to discriminate. You want to separate. It, it says in Hebrews 5.14 that the solid food of the Word is for the mature, who, because of practice, has trained his senses to be able to discern between good and evil. That's discriminating. You can tell. Right. Good from evil. You, you put it, you're able to put it to the test, all right? But it says the solid food of the Word gives you the ability to do that when you've practiced by, by training your senses, all right? Now, when it says examine, that's not a cursory, that's not a glance, that's not a cursory examination, but it is a careful, prayerful, spiritual appraisal of all things. Now, the fact is, I, and, and again, I will stand by what I'm about to say. 
that it is obvious to me. And if you think this is being judgmental, uh, well, you know, I can live with that. And I'm not admitting to it, but I can, I can live with you calling me judgmental. It is obvious to me that, that all too many people do not properly test what they hear spoken. And Christ said, be careful what you listen to. First you have to test, then you have to properly test. A lot of people just don't even test. Well, no, most people don't test. That's what right. I'm saying. They, they don't. If it feels good, you know, if it, if it sounds good, if it tickles their ears, which is what Paul warned against in, in 2 Timothy, he said, you know, in the last days, men will not endure sound doctrine. So they'll accumulate for themselves teachers who teach according to their own desires, who tickle their ears. If it sounds good, if it feels good, you know, it was a saying in the 60s, I think, if it feels, it feels good, good, do it. it. Right. You know what? That's not the answer. That's satanic. Well, here's what Paul had to say again to the Corinthians. Second, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, he said, A natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God for their foolishness to him. And he cannot understand them because they are spiritually appraised. But he who is spiritual appraises all things, yet he himself is appraised by no one. Now, I receive, I, I, I receive very little, but I receive enough hate mail. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, yeah, I do. People call me and tell me I'm stupid, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a this, I'm a that. You know, that I believe this nonsense called Christianity. It would be easy in the natural to get upset with that. But I don't operate in the natural. And when I receive something like that, here's what I try and do. Rejoice always. Give thanks in all things. Forgive, love, and respond according to the Word of God. Because you want to know something? They can't understand it. They're still in the natural. They're, they, they can't understand these spiritual things. You know, they can look, but they can't understand it. And one other other thing that you do is you examine yourself. Yes, first. I do. I said, which is a good thing to do. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, you're right. You know, I didn't say that, but Paul writes and says, "But examine everything carefully." Yes. The first thing you should examine is examine yourself. Exactly. And Paul writes that also, by the way. Mm -hmm. So it's like if somebody accuses you of something, before you do anything, mm -hmm. examine yes. yourself and see if they're right. And see if they're right. <laughs> Because God can do that. Well, God will do that, yeah. and that's a blessing. Mm -hmm. Because the fact of the matter is, we often are blind to failings in our own life. That's, right. that's true, and that's why you need to have this objective view of yourself. And how do you get an objective view of yourself? By testing yourself, not by how good you think you are, not by how you feel, but by the Word of God. Everything is going to always go back to the Word of God. So. When you appraise something, now appraise if you take a diamond uh, to a jeweler and ask him to appraise it and tell you what it's worth, what's that, what's that guy going to do? He's going to take, for, he may take a cursory look at it to make sure you didn't have it handed him a, a rock, all right, or a piece of ice. But then he's going to grab his loop. Mm. Close huh? examination. And now he is going to give it a close, careful examination. The Word of God is our loop. The Word of God is what we're supposed to be able to look through to see and appraise something. We talked a lot in this study over the last 15 weeks about uh, not only the Thessalonians, but the Bereans. Yes. Because if you remember, when Paul was forced out of Thessalonica, he went to Berea. Mm -hmm. And as was his practice, as he had done in Thessalonica, the first thing he does when he shows up, he goes and goes to the quote-unquote the people of God to bring the message of Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach, the promised Messiah of Israel. Well, they did what the Thessalonians hadn't even done, or the Jews, so many of the Jews in Thessalonia hadn't, hadn't done. It says in Acts 17, now these, those Jews in Berea, were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica, for they received the word with great eagerness examining the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. Acts 17, 11. 
They tested what Paul said. How did they test it? They went back into the Word of God to see if what he was saying was true, according to the Word. Not whether it felt good to them, not whether they liked it, not whether they liked Paul, but whether it lined up with the Word of God. You know, I have been blessed to have the opportunity to preach in a lot of places in this world. And I have gotten into the habit when I go to places because people, you know, the first time I go there, they don't know me. They don't know who I am. And I'll say to them, don't, don't take my word for anything. Whatever I'm about to speak, whatever God gives me to speak to you now, I want you to test it and see, make sure that it lines up with the word. And if it's not the word of God that I speak to you, kick me out. Stop being nice. Stop pussyfooting around. Stop playing church. If I come into your church and I speak things and they're not true, get me out of there as fast as you possibly can. Stop being diplomatic. Stop being diplomatic. <laughs> However, if what I say is the Word of God, lines up with the Word of God, then you are now responsible for it. That's and you want to know something? If you're listening to me right now, that that's same that's thing that's is true. Mm -hmm. I'm not asking you to take my word for what I say here at this table. I am asking you to test what I say against the whole Word of God. Meditate on it. Talk to the Lord about it. And if what I'm saying is not the Word of God, don't come back. But if it is the Word of God, I would pray that you would have an eagerness for it, like the Bereans had an eagerness for the Word of God. Because it's something I don't see much of in the church today either, is an eagerness for the Word of God. Okay. Now, you can't use the words, the world's, tools to appraise spiritual truth. That's operating in the flesh. See, that's what happens. If you appraise things by, oh, that sounds good to me, it feels good to me, and I like what you're saying, you know, oh boy, that's, if you use those tools, the feelings, you will be misled. Because Satan can operate on your feelings. I promise you that. How do you know if something is true when it's prophet? One of the things is, and this, I want to go all the way back to Deuteronomy. Okay. And God spoke this, he said, But the prophet who speaks a word presumptuously in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or which he speaks in the name of other gods, that prophet shall die. Whoa. So if you're out there and you're a prophet, brother, you better make sure what you're speaking is the word of God. You may say in your heart, how will we know the word which the Lord has spoken? How are you going to know if what this person is saying is the word of God? When a, when a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the thing does not come about or come true, that is the thing which the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously. You shall not be afraid of him. If somebody comes and they say that they have prophecy, it had better come true. We, I have seen, in my three and a half decades in the, in the body of Christ, I have seen so many quote-unquote prophets mm -hmm. who have made statements that didn't come to pass. Mm -hmm. And yet, they're, still, they're still out there and they're still running around. And they're invited back. They're invited back and they're still sucking your dollars up. Why? Because Why? I don't know the answer to that. But I'll tell you this, it shouldn't be. We need to get to that place where we are serious about the Word of God. But how do you know something is true? Jesus made this perfectly clear. At least it's perfectly clear to me. He said to those Jews who had believed in Him, If you abide in my Word, then you are truly disciples of mine. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. John chapter 8, verse 31 and 32. If you abide, if you live, if you dwell in God's Word, then you're truly God's disciple, Jesus' disciple. You'll know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Otherwise, you're going to be bound up in lies. I'm just going to go back. I want to say this again. The Bereans were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica, for they received the Word with great eagerness. We've talked about this a number of times here, and I'm just going to go over this real quickly. There was a hunger and eagerness for the Word of God that I used to see that I don't see today. I've traveled to churches on five continents, and it is rare indeed to find Bible studies. I'm talking about real Bible studies. I'm not talking about, you know, just a little bit before Sunday services, somebody stands up with a book. 
I am talking about where people get together and they examine the Word, they get into the Word, they dwell on the Word, they meditate on the Word. I'm that's rare. Why? Where is that eagerness going? When it, where is that hunger and thirst for righteousness and the Word? Well, when that goes, you know what we're doing? We're stifling the Holy Spirit. We're stifling. This can happen. It can happen to the best of us. Ha <laughs> ha. It can certainly happen to those who are not the best of us. Mm -hmm. Paul had to write to this faithful man of God, his son in the faith, Timothy, and say, kindle afresh the gift that God has given you. Gotta, you got to stoke that fire. you got to feed that fire to keep it going. Any fire that's left alone is going to die out. This Word of God is fuel to that fire. The Holy Spirit is that mighty rushing wind that... that Fans the flames of that fire. And that's why we need each other. And that, that is why we need each other. These are days when we desperately need good fellowship. We need each other in our lives. Mm -hmm. Remember we talked about that. One of the things that Paul talked about here is encouraging one another. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we better do that. But beware. These are days of false prophets. Jesus said that in Matthew 24 talking about when the disciples came to him and said, tell us what the signs will be of the end of the age and your coming. And one of the things that Jesus talked about was the multiplicity and abundance of false prophets. Learn how to test the prophets. Learn how to examine what people are saying and test it against the Word of God so you will not be deceived. Because I'm going to tell you something, in the natural, Satan has had a lot more practice at lying than you have had at discerning. He's been doing it for a long time. He's good at lying. He's the father of lies. He's a liar by nature. Mm -hmm. He is practiced at lying. The first revelation of the devil in, in Genesis chapter 3 is that he was more crafty, more subtle than any other beast of the field. You need to get into the Word, you need to stay in the Word, and you need to live by the Word, led by the Spirit of God. Hallelujah. Okay. Verse 22, 522, Paul says, abstain from every form of evil. Evil comes in a lot of forms. You know, I, I, I had this, uh, Paul also in, in writing, I think to Timothy, says, uh, be on your guard against every form of greed. Every appearance of no, yeah, but, yeah, but greed can take a lot of different forms. Yes. I, I think most people have narrowed greed down. It's, it's like, right. you know, Scrooge McDuck, you look at you look at dollars and dollar signs start to flip around in your eyes and so greed can come in a lot of different forms. You can have greed over a lot of different things. That greed can be subtle, it can be overt, it can be open. Evil comes in a lot of different ways. But we're not to focus on the evil, right? When we abstain from every form of evil, you don't have to you don't have to go out and buy a book on all the things that are evil and study evil. And you don't need to go out searching for right. it. I doubt very seriously that somebody who's an expert on poison has drunk every type of poison to find out how they work. You don't need to go out and test evil by doing evil. It says we should hunger and thirst for righteousness. We should seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And you want to know something? When you know the truth, the lie will become evident. When you know goodness, when you know the things of the Spirit, the evil will become apparent. Right? Because they are all perversions of the truth. Satan has no creative power. He doesn't bring anything into existence. Do you understand that? Mm -hmm. nice. So he can't even create... I mean, a lie is not a created thing. It is a perversion of an existing thing. What's the existing thing? The existing thing is truth. So every lie is a truth that the devil has twisted. When you understand... I, I think this is true. I've heard this a lot of times. The, the Treasury Department, when they teach, they make experts on being able to distinguish counterfeit bills. They don't tell, they don't spend years looking at every type of counterfeit. No. What they learn is the real thing. Because when you truly, truly know the real thing, any counterfeit is going to become obvious to you. Very obvious. And that's the way it should be with us as Christians. You should know what the difference is between walking in the flesh and walking in the spirit. 
You should know the things when somebody comes along and says this or says that and it doesn't line up with the Word of God. It should, it should ring out to you. There is a version of the Bible which I, should, I will not name because I don't want to talk about the Message Bible out loud. Mm -hmm. But I'm just going to tell you that one of the things that I find shocking about that trans... It's not even a translation of the Bible. Even the guy that wrote it doesn't claim it to be a translation of the Bible. But the fact is, thousands upon thousands upon thousands of, of Christians are using this book in place of the Word of God. And it's, I, I would just tell you this. They're studying the I, I want to tell you my first encounter with, with this thing. I was in, Alice and I were in uh, Southern California on our travels, and we were at uh, one of the largest churches in the world. I'm not going to mention Saddleback by name. And anyhow, so we were sitting there, and we're in the midst of these services, and they have, of course, the great big gigantic uh, screens up on, on the front, thing. And, and, front. And, yeah, and, and, and uh, yeah, they have them all over the place. And as the, this, whoever was preaching is preaching, you know, they're flashing these sayings up on the uh, on these screens. And I'm sitting there, I think, well, that reminds me of, of a scripture. It reminds me, of, almost it reminds me of a scripture. Until it dawns on me that what they're putting up there is they're calling the scripture. Well, the Word of God is holy, precious, and pure. Right? It is not to be tampered with. We did a two-hour study on on the, that Bible or that book. That book. That book. I won't even grace it by calling it a Bible. And but what shocked me was that people could see some of these scriptures and not recognize. Wait a minute. There's something wrong here. That's not what the Word of God says. But if you don't know what the Word of God says, you're not going to be struck by the difference between what that book says and what the Word of God says. You have to know the Word to recognize that there's something wrong with what they're saying. And 99% and of the verses, they could be a good paraphrase. But it's that 1% that is totally off well, that'll, that's that what it that's all that's what the is. abomination. Uh, if you were going to poison somebody, you would not give them a right. glass of poison. You would give them a glass of what they like to drink with a few drops of poison in it. That's all it takes. The truth with a twist. And truth you, you twist, had yeah. like a two-hour conversation with these people, and there's two guys trying well, to say, well, there's a lot of good in it. And he says, yeah, but it doesn't matter. It's the poison. All right. So. In verse 23, oh. yes, what we have here, because we've gotten to the, at 15 weeks, we have come to the end of Paul's letter. And what Paul does now, he has instructed them. But as is Paul's fashion, now he prays for them. Mm -hmm. Because he does what he preaches. He lives what he preaches. So when he says to pray for one another, guess what? Paul prays for, for the people he ministers to. So here's his closing prayer. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely. May your spirit and soul and body be preserved complete without blame at the coming of the Lord, our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he who calls you, and he also will bring it to pass. He's praying for these people he ministered to, because we need to be praying for one another. And this is a good kind of prayer. If you examine all of Paul's letters where he's praying for the people that he ministered to. But it, it's good because he's praying for God to say, we, want, we should have a desire to be holy. Yes. To be holy even as he is holy. To be perfect as he is perfect. But this is not something you can always achieve by yourself. It takes the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. So here's the comfort. Here's the encouragement. May the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely. The work that God has begun in you, God is able to complete in you. And that's what he's saying here. Preserving, complete, without blame at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know why? Because Jesus Christ carried away your sin. He who knew no sin became sin for our sake. Like the scapegoat. And that's why the Word of God can say that your sin has been cast as far as the east is from the west. There will be no blame. I'll quickly say this. Before I got saved, years and years and years ago, I used to have this horrible vision of heaven. I wasn't sure I wanted to go. 
because here was my vision of heaven. When you get there, it's like everybody that ever existed is at the drive-in movie. And when it comes your turn, you get to look up and see every single thing that you ever did. Ouch. Ouch. My mommy would be in that crowd. I don't need my mommy seeing some of the stuff that I've done. And hallelujah, when God has forgiven my sin, he has forgotten my sin, never to call it a mind to mind again. So I stand without blame. Not because I was good, not because I'm righteous, Nothing. but because of the work of Jesus Christ who hung on a cross and said, it is finished. Hallelujah. Then he says, brethren, pray for us. Prayer is a mutual thing. We need to be praying for one another. And we need to be consistent. We need to be persistent. And we need to be dedicated and devoted to this. Because you want to know something? The road of this life is a bumpy road. Yes. And the only thing that protects us is the work of Jesus Christ, who smooths the path of that. And Christ is gone. Hallelujah. He died, was buried, was resurrected, and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. Who is here now? Because he, God will never leave us, nor forsake us. The Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is at work in us. And we can pray without ceasing. We can pray in a heavenly language. We can pray when we don't know what to pray for. But praying for one another. Blessing one another. I covet your prayers. And I trust me, that's not greed. It's not a form of greed. It's a form of need. Let me say that again because I like that. I covet your prayers, and that's not a form of need, of greed, it's a form of need. I need your prayers. I, I'm not any more able than you are to walk in the footsteps of Jesus Christ on my own power. I don't lean on my own understanding. So I, I'll tell you what, I'll pray for you, you pray for me. Okay. Verse 26. Greet the brethren you really, really like. No. Oh, greet all. Oh, greet all the brethren with a holy kiss. You know, um, I don't know that I ever kissed my father. I just don't know. Well, you know he kissed you. I'm sure he kissed me when I was a child. But it was that culture, you know, men don't kiss men. When I had been saved and I became pastor of the church in, up in New York, um, which was predominantly Italian, I mean, and, and many kind of older Italians. And I would see the men coming together and plant a kiss on each cheek. And by the way, I've seen that now in many cultures outside of the United States. That's common practice in many, many cultures. Um, the fact of the matter is it's, it's a visible expression of our love for one another. And we need to have that visible expression. I am saddened when I see Christians who see each other and just ignore each other. There should be a joy in coming together. And I'm not just, I'm not, I promise you, talking about coming together in that building that you call a church. I am talking about when I meet you in public, the grocery store. If I meet you on the street, I want to have joy, I will have joy at seeing you. And I, I got in trouble for one company, Christian company I worked for, because they, they complained that I was a hugger. Yes. Because I, I walk up to people, I just, if I know you're a Christian, I, go, I may not plant a kiss on you, I don't know. But I will surely walk up and grab you and give you a lovely hug. Because the love of God has been poured into my heart through His Holy Spirit. The love of God that I have for you. And I want to express that love. Greet one another. If you don't give them a kiss, brother, show, visibly show that you love you have. Better is an open rebuke than love unspoken. Show your love. And then Paul says, verse 27, I adjure you by the Lord to have this letter read to all the brethren. Discipleship. Paul wrote to Timothy and said, The things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, these things entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. This has to pass along. That's what discipleship is about. And that's what Jesus said, Go into the whole world and make disciples. What you hear, what you learn, pass it along to somebody else who will then pass it along to somebody else. 
I'm going to ask you tonight, share this site with others. Tell others about this Bible study. If you're blessed by this, tell others. Let others come to it. And then he says, and I will say with Paul, I will join with Paul in saying, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. So until next time, may the Lord our God, which will be next year, May the Lord our God bless you and use you for the glory of his name.